There goes an old saying, the higher you climb, the harder you fall. And this expression applies to each and every one of us. Which is probably why, when famous wrestling champion Chris Benoit committed several devastating actions, his descent back to Earth would shock a nation and the entire wrestling community. Welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. My name is Adrian, and in today's video we'll be talking about the twisted case of Chris Benoit. Chris was a heavyweight wrestling champion whose time in the spotlight may have led to the untimely end of multiple lives. But what exactly happened to him? Today we study his story and his psychology. And by the way, I post solved, unsolved and strange cases here on a weekly basis. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. And so with that said, pull up a seat, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Chris Benoit. Our case today is a little different to our usual structure, as in this video we'll be looking into the life of professional wrestler Chris Benoit. Chris lived a life unlike many I cover here. He was born on the 21st of May 1967 in Montreal, Canada to parents Michael and Margaret Benoit, but shortly after this his family made the move to the city of Edmonton. From a very young age Chris's passion in wrestling blossomed. He followed wrestling religiously, which led to his childhood fantasy of one day becoming a wrestler. And at the young age of 12, Chris began his training journey in order to achieve his dream. His parents supported his decision wholeheartedly, his father Mike buying him his first set of weights so the young Chris could learn discipline and begin weight training. It's around this time that Chris discovered his idols within the wrestling community. Having seen Tom Billington, also known as Dynamite Kid, and Bret Hart perform at local matches in Edmonton. Eventually, his dreams became true, and he actually ended up training with Tom, even adopting some of his fighting mannerisms and signature moves a notable one being the diving headbutt. So, Chris's teenage years were filled with hard work, discipline and training. He began work with the Hart family in their so-called Hart Family Dungeon, which over the years has produced several notable wrestlers. And all of this training paid off, as in 1985 at the age of 18, Chris made his professional debut in a Stampede Wrestling promotion. His first match was a tag team match, in which he won alongside Rick Patterson, finishing this game with a sunset flip, pinning his opponent. And from here, his wrestling career rocketed. He ended up splitting his time between Canada and Japan, spending months at a time competing in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And after this, he moved to Mexico and then Germany, gaining experience and notoriety to debut in a professional circuit in America. Throughout his career, Chris achieved numerous titles from the most prestigious wrestling associations, such as World Championship Wrestling or WCW, and WWF, which is now known as WWE. Chris's performance peaked in the year 2004, where he officially won the World Heavyweight Championship. And no doubt, Chris had an astonishing career. But what about his personal life? Chris married twice within his 22-year wrestling career. First to Martina in 1988, with which he fathered two children, David and Megan. However, this marriage wouldn't last. Martina wanted a more simpler lifestyle, something Chris couldn't give her. She didn't want to be in the spotlight for the rest of her years. Martina also claimed that Chris allegedly also had a problem with steroid use, which often made him irate and hard to deal with. Although she hated this side of him, Martina still loved Chris dearly, and when off steroids, he was described as one of the sweetest men you would ever meet. The relationship was strung along until the year 1997, where the couple eventually divorced. However, this wasn't as clean as the media would like to make you to believe, as in 1997, Chris started an affair with female wrestler Nancy Sullivan. Nancy was the wife of Kevin Sullivan, a fellow high-profile wrestler and one of Chris's peers. It's no secret that wrestling is all part of a show, with a high level of theatrics and implied drama involved. On screen, the love triangle between Chris, Nancy and Kevin was initially staged, but eventually Kevin realised that the situation was becoming all too real behind the scenes. A situation that would one day lead to heartbreak. The affair led to Nancy divorcing Kevin before embarking on an official relationship with Chris. The rather complicated situation led Nancy to hang up a wrestling kit for good, and instead she would take a back seat, changing her career path to book and manage plans for her new partner. Chris and Nancy's relationship would jump from strength to strength, and in the year 2000 they would eventually marry, before welcoming their first and only son into the world, Daniel Benoit. Happiness would follow the family for some time, However, in the year 2003, Nancy filed for a divorce, unfortunately for similar reasons to Chris's first wife, Martina. Chris worked hard to keep his marriage above water, 
and upon intervention from their families, he genuinely seemed to realise the consequences of his behaviour. As a result, Nancy eventually gave him another chance. It's no secret that the abuse of testosterone and steroids are rife within several fitness communities. From Olympic team controversy, all the way down to your local gym, people often abuse it. This was no different in the wrestling community. People who often want to be big, mean and menacing often achieve their goals through artificial means. One of the most well-known and well-documented side effects of steroid use is roid rage, and potentially this could be linked to Chris's anger management problems with both of his wives. Wrestlers also face a range of other health problems too. They put their bodies through constant physical trauma, and they endure more hits than any human should on a frequent basis. Touching upon the more critical areas, this includes strikes to the abdomen, the face, and more specifically, the head. This continued abuse of their bodies can often have serious health complications especially when it comes to critical areas such as a wrestler's head. But Chris wasn't afraid to use his own body as a battering ram. See, although Chris would endure these blows on a very regular basis, he would never seek medical attention after his fights, and instead he took the brunt of his pain alone. This was arguably a foolish move on his behalf, and in hindsight it's now speculated if Chris maybe had frequent if not continuous concussions as a result of these moves. This combination of drug usage and physical damage to the human body are just two of several reasons why being a wrestler has a lower than average life expectancy when compared to other occupations. And tragically, Chris was no stranger in seeing these consequences firsthand. Throughout Chris's career, he became close to many of his peers. He was known to be friendly, jovial, and a good sportsman. This led to him befriending fellow wrestler Eddie Guerrero while he was staying in Japan. Eddie and Chris were extremely close friends, but sadly, in November of 2005, Eddie suddenly passed away at the age of 38. He was found in a hotel room with his toothbrush in hand. The man had suddenly succumbed to heart failure. This man was instrumental to Chris. In fact, his death hit Chris harder than anything else in his life, as blatantly seen in his televised memoriam. I, I know, I know that, that you, you're in a better place, and I know that you're looking down on me right now. Knowing know that I love you. <laughs> it's clear to see that Chris was deeply affected by his friend's death, and following this loss, those around him agreed that Chris was never the same afterwards, falling into a deep depression that would follow him through until 2007. On June the 19th, 2007, Chris faced off against Delia Burke, and Chris would go on to win the match. However, he seemed a lot less charismatic and much more out of character. A strange coincidence, as little did everyone know, that this match would be the last time that Chris would ever perform again. Less than one week later, on the weekend of the 23rd of June, the wrestler was due to make appearances at other events. However, he would cancel his Friday appearance, claiming that his son Daniel and his wife Nancy were severely ill with food poisoning, and he was busy taking them to the hospital. He insisted to his agent that he would board a flight the next day for his appearance at the ECW Heavyweight Championships. He was scheduled to work with a man named Chavo Guerrero, the nephew of his now-dead close friend, Eddie Guerrero. However, as Saturday rolled around, Chavo received a very strange voicemail from Chris. He therefore decided to call him back. That was strange. So I call him right back. And I go, hey man, are you, are you alright? I'm fine, man. Like I said, I just had a, a real hard weekend, you know, and, and, and just, you know, I had to go to the, take him, you know, Nad, Daniel and Nancy to the hospital. And I'm like, oh, okay, man, well, I'm here, okay, okay, man, okay, cool, cool. So then, hung up, and that was the last I actually talked to him. The two had a rather sporadic conversation, which mostly consisted of multiple phone calls and voicemails. Chavo eventually concluded that Chris would arrive at Houston Airport on Sunday at around 8am, where Chavo would then pick him up for their public event. One thing Chavo did find strange was the way in which Chris ended the call. He put great emphasis in saying, Hey Chavo, I love you. Now, Chris and his fellow wrestlers would often say this to each other, but the way in which he said it this time was different. It was nothing to his usual tone. But with their schedule now supposedly confirmed, Chavo tucked himself in for the night, ready to pick up Chris from the airport at 8am. However, at 3.53am that very same morning, Chavo was abruptly woken up to a very energetic mobile phone. The alert was a text message from Chris which read, the dogs are in the enclosed pool area. Garage side door is open. Just 30 seconds later, he received the very same text message, but this time from Nancy's phone. The dogs are in the enclosed pool area. Garage side door is open. 
This was followed by a new text message from Chris, saying, My physical address is 130 Green Meadow Lane, Fayetteville, Georgia, 30215. Chavo was obviously perplexed by these messages, they were very strange, but it was 4am in the morning, and he was going to see Chris in a few hours anyway. And so, something he would later regret, Chavo went back to sleep, expecting to see his friend Chris in the morning. Very little did Chavo know, that he wasn't the only person to receive these cryptic messages. They were also sent to four other colleagues and co-workers, all saying the same thing or similar. And so, as dawn slowly eroded the night's darkness away, the morning sun rose along with Chavo Guerrero, who was now waiting for Chris at Houston Airport. By 8.28am, Chris's flight had supposedly arrived. However, as time crept by, he was nowhere to be seen. Minutes turned into an hour, then two hours, then three. Surely Chris wasn't being held up for this long. Chavo came to the conclusion that this was a no-show. Chris had already missed both his Friday and Saturday appearances, so this was just another one. As WWE was alerted to Chris's disappearance, they reached out to understand what was going on. They called his home phone, and then his cell phone, but there was no answer. And after checking all local hospitals, still nothing. They therefore decided to leave a voicemail instead. Hey Chris, it's Dan from the office, just trying to get in touch with you. It is Sunday evening, um, I think about 7 o'clock, so we're hoping everything is okay, so if you can call me on my cell phone. By 11pm, the team had no idea as to where Chris was. And sadly, none of them were made aware of his strange text messages until noon the next day. Those who had received Chris's text messages had been discreetly quiet, thinking that they were doing him a favour by covering for him. But unfortunately, they had no idea as to what was actually going on. Immediately after being notified of these messages, Chris's agent contacted Fayetteville Police, where a welfare check was then requested. Hi, uh, I just spoke to one of the other officers there. My name is Dennis Fagan, I'm a retired detective in New York City. I run the security for World Wrestling, and one of our wrestlers that lives down there is missing. And he told me to just to say we need a welfare check done. And yesterday he was supposed to show up at a pay-per-view and never got on the plane, never showed up. They've tried to reach his wife, Nancy, she doesn't answer, they've tried to call his house. It's, unlo it's, it's out of character for him. So at uh, 3 o'clock this morning there was a message left for one of the other wrestlers, and basically it says... Uh, uh, the dogs are in the backyard, the back door is open, goodbye, and that was it. Lieutenant Larry Alden was the first officer on the scene. Larry already knew of Chris, seeing him at the gym a couple times per week, but nothing more than that. Making his way to the Benoit family property, he spoke to their neighbour, Holly. She made the offer to secure the family dogs, as she would often look after them while the family were away. Larry agreed. Letting herself in with a key trusted from the family, she stepped in to secure the two German Shepherds while Larry waited outside. However, just several minutes later, Holly sprinted out from the house, screaming frantically. While inside, she had found Chris's son, Daniel, and he was dead. Police stormed the property, and upon inspection, they would also find the bodies of Nancy and Chris. Nancy was found in the upstairs bedroom, her hands and feet bound. Her body had been wrapped in a towel, with the Bible placed next to her. The cause of her death was ruled as strangulation. Daniel was found in his own bedroom, and unlike his mother, he had not been bound, nor did he have any external injuries. This suggesting that he was suffocated rather than strangled. A Bible had also been placed near his body, and downstairs, in his own home gym, was the body of Chris Benoit. He was found hanging from the top of his lateral pull-down machine. The WWE was notified of the discovery, and the house quarantined as a crime scene. However, upon further investigation, they found no external interference to the household. There was no forced entry. Upon close examination of the bodies, it became evident that all three of them had died at different times. Authorities concluded that Nancy had died first on Friday the 22nd of June. Toxicology reports found alcohol in her body, and it appeared that she had struggled against her assailant. Daniel was likely murdered the next day on Saturday. He had been sedated with Xanax, and it's likely he was unconscious at the time of his death. And finally, it appeared as if Chris had taken his own life the following day on Sunday. He had killed his wife, and then his son, before turning on himself. Friends, family, and the wrestling community as a whole were mortified and devastated by the news. And before learning of these tragic circumstances, WWE prematurely aired a three-hour tribute to Chris Benoit, celebrating the man and his accomplishments. 
But the very next day, after learning of his actions, they backtracked on this decision. With despair over the loss of a wrestling champion, anger and disgust dance simultaneously over the knowledge of his actions against his own wife and son. Confusion ripped throughout the international community, and many were left unable to comprehend Chris's actions. As expected, opinions over the matter spread like wildfire. And the main question left in the middle of all of this was why? Why did Chris claim the lives of his own wife and son? The question, as a whole, is extremely difficult to answer, and putting it short, Chris is no longer around to share his thoughts or reasoning. As with any celebrity death, conspiracy theories started to crop up, one being the work of an old rival, one being a government setup, and the other being a home invasion. In short, there were many people who couldn't believe that Chris, someone they admired, was capable of doing such despicable things. And while conspiracy theories won't be entertained, there are a few key factors worth mentioning. Chris was a regular steroid user, which is a very common problem within the wrestling industry. But his actions were not consequential of steroids. His actions were methodical and committed over multiple days, not symptomatic of roid rage. Toxicology reports also concluded that the only testosterone found in his body were at therapeutic levels, not enough for adverse side effects. Which leaves us with one other theory, one which has become much more prominent since the time of Chris's death. And of course, I'm talking about his psychological condition. Chris was well known to take an absolute beating in the ring. He would often slam his head down onto people from the top rope, and was regarded as one of the only wrestlers who could take a metal chair to the back of the head. This repetitive physical trauma to Chris's head had indeed caused physical and psychological damage. Brain scans, which observed the condition of Chris's brain, showed that he had severe chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also known as CTE, which in short is a progressive and fatal brain disease associated with repeated traumatic brain injuries including concussions and repeated blows to the head. In fact, Chris's brain was in such poor condition that the neurosurgeon who studied his brain concluded that the damage caused to his brain was reminiscent of an 85-year-old patient with Alzheimer's. It's worth mentioning that as modern science advances, more and more data suggests that traumatic brain injuries lead to a myriad of problems. This includes cognitive problems such as reasoning and judgement, executive functions such as poor decision-making, behavioural changes including difficulty with self-control and risky behaviour, and emotional changes such as depression, anxiety, mood swings, anger, and even lack of empathy. Many of these changes, when enabled in the right format, could lead to atrocities such as murder. Chris's brain was compared to that of four retired NFL players, all of which had also suffered from repeated head trauma. And, not so coincidentally, all four ended up sinking into depression, violence, and self-harm. Whether or not Chris's actions were a result of a medical condition, depression, rage, or otherwise, we will never fully know. However, all of the evidence available suggests that this man ultimately lost the fight with his own mind. The only thing that is certain in this story is the tragedy behind two innocent people who lost their lives that weekend. In a case such as this, it's easy to focus our story on the perpetrator who just so happens to also be a celebrity. But just as important, if not more important, were the lives of Nancy and Daniel Benoit. A loving and supporting mother who gave her career for her husband, and a young seven-year-old boy at the very beginning of his life, were murdered by the one man they depended on the most. In a dark, terrifying and confusing world, Chris Benoit should have protected Nancy and Daniel from danger. And from a psychological perspective, who knows how much of Chris actually stood in front of them on the weekend their lives were snuffed out. And that just about wraps up today's case. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this video interesting or insightful, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. And thank you to Min Luang for recommending this case. I found this one to be particularly interesting. It once again shows the correlation between psychology and physical injury. As always, please share your thoughts in the comment section down below, and I'll see you again real soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, look after each other. Goodbye.